Why do we work so hard to get to the top? I'm told that eight men in the world possess more wealth than the bottom half of the world's population. Just eight men possess more wealth than the bottom half of the world. Why is it so important to get to the top? I remember my senior year of high school. I was at the top of the school and the top of everything I'd been working so hard for all those years. But even with all that hard work, my senior year became a story of missing the mark. I went out for football in seventh grade. My freshman year, the varsity team went into the last game of the season zero and eight. That didn't stop the last game from being filled with anticipation because the other team was also zero and eight. And so we ended the season on the awesome note of one and eight. But my classmates dedicated to turning the program around. We worked hard. I could still tell you right now the footwork for every, how many feet I'm supposed to take for every step of a play. And that led us to the last game of my senior year with an eight and one record. Not perfect, but the only team we lost to at that point was the state champions five years running. We worked hard ending the season eight and one. We were celebrating on the bus ride home only to hear the news over the radio that because of some odd point system, we had nine districts in our division level and they can only take 16 teams to state, so two second place teams don't go. We found out that we were one of those two second place teams. It was like falling off a mountain. I started playing music in first grade, piano, and then I got into band and choir and then organ. A junior year, I had the honor of being the lead in the musical. I was so pumped up for senior year, ready to put my heart and soul into another musical. And the casting assignments came out. I wasn't the lead. I wasn't a primary supporting character. I got part three in a four-man barbershop quartet side roll. Someone ripped the mountain right under for my feet. I began wrestling when I was in third grade. And I really sucked at wrestling at first. <laughs> I mean, I was bad. <laughs> and not only at first, even in seventh grade, I maybe only won a quarter of my matches and probably got a pinned a third of them, okay? <laughs> but I kept working hard. My senior year, I got second place at the conference meet. Then regionals came. My only real challenge was the guy I lost to at conference. He ended up doing pretty well at state. And I'd been working hard the rest of the season to find a way to beat him. But then the match before the championship, before I faced that guy again, I got caught in a move and lost. It was like going over the edge of a cliff into an icy sea, it hurt so bad. I started school in kindergarten, obviously. I worked hard there as well. Never once in high school did I have a study hall. <laughs> and my senior year, I managed to fit 10 classes into an eight-period day, doing weightlifting and jazz band before school, college calculus and English, and still having all the after-school activities as well. I was the top student in pretty much every class. Then the valedictorian was announced. A good friend of mine, who is truly a wonderful person, but who had three study halls her senior year, and whose only plan after school was to become the wife of a farmer, which isn't a bad thing, they say, but she got the honor that I busted my butt for. Mountains suck. <laughs> What makes mountains the place we want to be? 
In the Old Testament, the poets and the prophets like to imagine Jerusalem, some call it the city of Zion, as a mountain. And it's not a bad high spot in the area if you've ever been there. But if you've been there, you know it ain't no mountain. In fact, the Mount of Olives, if you go to the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Olives is at least twice as high as Jerusalem, as Mount Zion. So it ain't even the tallest land mass in the area. But Isaiah loves this vision. In the days to come, Isaiah says, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. And everyone's going to say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. Everyone wants to be on the mountain. We work hard to get to the top, to have the best house, or to have the first virtual reality system in the neighborhood, or the best seats at the sporting events, the nice tickets to the opera. Or maybe instead you're working to be the slimmest me you've been since high school, or the fastest runner at the local marathon, or employee of the month. Or maybe your goal is simply getting the most approved, improved award or making the Christmas turkey that'll be so much better than Cousin Vinny's Thanksgiving turkey that people will be talking about it for years. In my family, the mountain was always the one who would be able to get the gift that would make mom cry. That was the mountain we tried to top. I don't care who you are. There's always a mountain to climb, and we enjoy climbing them. There's a reward of some kind at the top, and we want that prize. But the irony today is that we're starting to tell a story this month where the highest point we're going to reach is kneeling down beside a manger. We generally don't see Jesus on mountains. And the few times we've seen Jesus on mountains, nearly everyone misses what's happening. The disciples misunderstood and fell down in fear and missed the most important moments of the transfiguration. Those same disciples, even when on the lower half of the mountain, fell asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane on the side of the Mount of Olives and missed the moment Jesus really needed prayer. With minor exceptions, the crowds, the Romans, the Jews, they all missed what was happening on the cross. And when the disciples had to sail into that storm, Christ had to descend from the mountain he'd been praying on to go meet them and calm their souls. When the disciples failed to heal, Jesus had to come down the mountain to do what they couldn't do. Jesus even told stories about a man who ran off the mountain to welcome his son who'd fallen so low he had been sleeping with the pigs. And it wasn't at the cross where anyone realized the truth. It was when Jesus was off that mountain and met the women in the garden, when Jesus went down the road and met the disciples who'd left Jerusalem, that people discovered what was really happening. Saul only became Paul when he descended from Jerusalem all the way down to Jericho. And there, Christ went down to meet him. A few years ago, I took some youth to help at a soup kitchen. Some of the people we met there were pretty awesome. But I got to tell you, there are also a couple really annoying people who kept trying to break the rules. There were a few grumps and an assortment of very odd temperaments. Afterwards, I was talking about the youth, about all the variety of people we met and served. One of the things I point out to the youth is, we don't know how any of these people got here. Maybe one of them lost their job and couldn't get work anywhere else. Maybe one of them is an ex-con. Maybe one of them got kicked out of their home as a teenager. Maybe one of them got divorced and lost everything in the settlement. Maybe one of them had a major medical event and went broke. Maybe one of them was born with millions but spent it all gambling. Maybe one of them turned to drugs at a college party. Maybe one of them got hooked on opioids after a traumatic injury. Maybe, the point is, 
We don't know. So we can't assume anything, either good or bad. They've fallen off the mountain. And it really doesn't matter what mountain they fell off or what caused them to fall. What matters is they're gathered here in this little room on a day when there's no place at the inn and no other table in town, they are welcome here. And we show them Christ by coming down our mountains and meeting them in their need for food, for warmth, for a smile, for a listening ear, for an understanding heart, for friendship, for someone simply to welcome them. I think about Isaiah's vision to go up the mountain where we make war no more, to go up the mountain where guns are melted down into implements of making food, where we instead of killing share a feast. I want to be on that mountain. I want to be up there on that mountain where that, all that violence is behind me and all of it is done and gone. But you know what? There are people down in the valley right now. There are people in the middle of war zones. They're not all on the other side of the world. Some of them are in our neighborhoods. And they need Christ to come down the mountain. God doesn't care whether you've made it to the top of the mountain nor how many times you've fallen, nor even if you're unable to get back up. If, Christ, if God cared about all that, <laughs> my life would have been over in 2003 after falling off so many mountains I'd been marked as a failure for eternity. What God is all about is being the one who comes down from the mountains and meeting us in the valleys, in the places where we've fallen. Whether by our fault or circumstances beyond our control, it doesn't matter. Christ comes down and meets us in our need. That's who Jesus is. Jesus is the one who came down from heaven to be born on earth, to give us hope, peace, joy, and most of all, love. May God meet you wherever you are today, whatever valley you're facing, and lift you up from there. Amen.